Hey guys, welcome to No Tucks Allowed. I am your host, Josh, and uh, for today's lunch, I ate myself a bacon croissant because, you know, that was what, that's what was available at the cafeteria at work when I showed up there. I probably ate lunch a little too early. But uh, to hear and enjoy, enjoy me and talk about his wonderful lunch, we have Big Pod. Hello. So I ate pasul, which is a traditional Serbian dish, and it was good. I think I've actually heard of that one before. Really? And uh, we have another guest with us today. Uh, he's feeling a little savvy, and we got this guy named Nick with us. How's hey it going there. today? Good, good. How are you? Uh, not too bad. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I had, I... Uh, well, I was going to say what I have for breakfast. Um, had a couple eggs and a pizza. It was great. <laughs> I don't know why I mixed those two together, but... In the what, what I had, the freshly cooked pizza or uh, the cold pizza? It, it was, that was left, left over. over. Yeah, okay. left over. <laughs> Nothing special there. Well, hey, uh, so a pizza is better than no pizza. <laughs> yeah, that's a <laughs> <Yep>. good point. <laughs> All right, so uh, as usual, uh, uh, we're going to talk about like what's going on in the world of Linux, even though uh, we are clearly injecting tux or into our show called No Tux Allowed. But of course, uh, Big Pod. It's been a it's been a hot minute since I've seen you face palm, right? So uh, we're we're gonna. Ne- I went on an adventure, and uh, really? this involved Debian. Oh, yes. Which I know. So that I don't you... don't think anything good happened. Uh, obviously, nothing good happened. You see, uh, I use very special hardware that encourages you to not use Debian stable. And uh, I decided I was going to make Debian Stable work for me. So uh, I pull in the kernel from their back porch repository, which comes, which pulls in Linux 6.10, which, hey, it's 6.10. It, I've got, I've had it working before. Okay, so uh, let's do that. And uh, let's get the V4L2 loopback module in, enabled in, in this. Oh, I also have to pull that from back ports. Okay, makes sense. Okay, so uh, let's... Uh, Oh, wait. Why am I not getting the uh, kernel module? But I'm getting the utilities for V4L2. If I check, I have V4L2 loopback installed on the system. Is it not compiling? Okay. Uh, I have the headers package installed. Well, guess what happened, uh, Mr. Big Pod? What? It turns out that when you install the Linux headers from the backports repository with the kernel, uh, at least at the time that I did it, the Linux headers package was actually outdated compared to the kernel, so it failed to... If So when you install a kernel module via your package manager, the, the script that the apt was calling to uh, compile the module was failing, and uh, I did not see it in the output. Ah. This was, I discovered this after I went down the rabbit hole of figuring out once again, on how to compile my own kernel, just to see if I can make shit work. <laughs> <laughs> which I got the kernel to compile properly, and I got it to boot, which was which was uh, special in my heart. I mean, I managed to get the like graphical session working; everything was working. I just couldn't get the kernel module to work. <laughs> and that, to me, is one of the smaller Achilles heels of Linux: the fact that. The kernel module has to be built for exact an exact version of kernel. That's, in my opinion, a big problem. Because if you, I don't know, let's take a look at NVIDIA drivers. I've been running same NVIDIA drivers on my Windows machine for, like, uh, since I installed Windows on my machine. Which was last week? Which <laughs> was last year. Oh, okay. So, so you haven't done the yearly reboot yet. Okay. No, I haven't done the yearly rebuild yet. And I'm sure I'm not going to do it yet because it's me. And I I don't, don't do that stuff because I, don't, I don't like to live on the edge, but because I'm lazy. <laughs> and I have okay. a lot of other stuff to do, like actually edit this podcast. Okay, okay. Well, anyways... uh. 
because you know I took the time to actually compile my own kernels, uh, I went down the rabbit hole of uh, figuring out how to sign my kernel because you know I I've been messing around with the uh, enabling secure boot on all my systems. Ooh. Uh, wow. I failed miserably. <laughs> I believe but it's fine. It, it's fine because uh, I ran a pseudo apt update, and uh, you know Debian package maintainers did their job and got things fixed before I had to report the issue. <laughs> right. <laughs> Although I still don't have secure boot working, probably because I just haven't turned it back on yet. <laughs> so speaking of kernels, in the Linux next branch, which is currently being built for 6.13, uh, there has been a merge request coming in uh, to remove Riser FS. It's finally happening. Uh, last I heard about removing Riser FS from the Linux kernel was a couple years ago, uh, because you know this file system has a bit of history behind it. But uh, yeah. this was pushed in by a SUSE engineer by, by the name of, uh, I think it's John Kara, J-A-N Kara. I believe that would be more correctly Jan Kara, because... Yeah, yeah that sounds right. Based uh, on that... the fact that he's Czech, I think it would be more of a <laughs> Slavic pronunciation, so uh -huh. it would be Jan. Okay, well, you see, I'm American, we don't speak these Slavic languages. <laughs> yeah, I want, one day I need to, need to teach you how to... There you go. How to read letters in a more sane <laughs> language I, i'm sorry i i speak and read uh american speaking well it's pretty easy to do a slavic language everything's phonetic right yes yeah, yeah it is it, it, it's awesome or in, <laughs> in most languages it's at least for the most part phonetic sure yeah chinese not being one of them yeah in most <laughs> we're kind of awesome like that yeah yeah no it's yeah. awesome so, anyways, uh, let's talk a little bit about the history of RiserFS. First of all, uh, I have never used RiserFS. I'm just going to say this now. Uh, for the longest time, I just used ext3 and ext4 uh, because, you know, RiserFS sounded complicated, and I didn't want to figure, figure it out because, you know, it wasn't installed by default on, on the system. Uh, do, have either of you messed around with RiserFS before? Negative. No. Too, uh, too old for me. Okay, okay. So, uh, for, for, you know... the for for you younger guys that have never messed around with Riser FS, uh, myself included, uh, Riser FS came out at a very interesting time in the open source space. We're talking about like the early two thousands, late nineties when uh, this came around, uh, and the big dog file systems at the time were UFS and well, not UFS. It was BSD something. Uh, B it BSD HFS maybe no that was Apple, but anyways uh the big file system on Linux systems was mostly just a uh, extent extended two or ext two or e uh, and ext three was still kind of the fresh kid on the block. Well, RiserFS came out with this wonderful feature called journaling, and uh, it also came out with uh, fa faster I/O operations, so you know it could read and write files faster or handling large files, lots of little files, and a couple other features that just made it a better option at the time. So, in fact, so good that OpenSUSE did the OpenSUSE thing and changed their default file system to RiserFS. Interesting. And uh, they ran on that for a while. <laughs> but, of until course... what? <laughs> uh, I think they wrote it all the way up right up until they switched to ButterFS. Oh wow! Okay, I believe yeah. they, in the middle they, before that they were before ButterFS they were on XFS mm -hmm. for some time, but not sure. Well, I think Tumbleweed went from RiserFS to ButterFS, uh, uh, and Leap might have stepped into. Uh, yeah, Sousa, Sousa up until shoot ext three on ten point two. And OpenSUSE 11 announced in 2006, it looks like. Oh, okay. Well, I know that they ran it for a bit of time. But, anyways, uh, the big historical issue with Riser FS, of course, is that Han Riser, the guy that came up with it, uh, got convicted of a murder charge. Uh, I'm not going to go too deep into the details with that. Uh, you can you can find that on your own independent research. That's yes. not our job on this show. But uh, <laughs> because since then, there there's basically it's been stale. And uh, so 
uh, it finally came in that uh, it's time for this to uh, get removed. <laughs> so on the, put on the chopping block, huh? Yeah, put it on the shopping block because <laughs> realistically, who's using Razer FS these days? Yeah, and if wild. you are and you know about the history of like what happened with the developer behind right. it, you're probably not using Razer FS. Even then, there are just better options these yeah, days. Yeah, could you imagine yes. like contributing nowadays to Razer FS and the source code over there for that file system? That'd be hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sorry, can't work on this right now. I'm currently in jail. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Right, writing from prison. Did uh, have you seen the letter that uh, was written from prison? Uh, well, yes, it is handwritten, and yeah. uh, I can quote it a little bit here. Uh, assuming that the decision is to remove V three <laughs> from the kernel, I have just one request: that for one last release, the README to be edited to add uh, Mikhail Gilva, uh, constant. Uh, Constantin uh, Savako and Antoli Pinchuk to the credits and then delete anything in there I might have said about why they were not credited. It's time to let go. Wow. Interesting. So, so there were just, some more dramas about it. I guess. Yeah. So uh, add, adding in a couple missing credits and... You know, uh, I don't know I'm if I want to be added in after. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, for I, someone I, writing I, from prison, and they're like, "Ah, oh, just add their names in, please." They're like, I don't know if I want to associate. Yeah, it's a good thing that like anything that I open source and publish myself doesn't actually see any use. Cause <laughs> I'm afraid. Same. same. <laughs> <laughs> I'm afraid. <laughs> But of course, uh, we ha we also have more kernel news as well, uh, because uh, Linus once again posted a two paragraph rant. Oh, my favorite! Three paragraph, three paragraph. I'm I'm sorry, but uh, so an individual by the name of Josh, uh, I'm gonna call that the uh, point buff. It's probably wrong comes out and says that, hey, uh, we have this issue that is theoretically really bad, and uh, this CPU seems to be, like, the cause of this bug. It's a power PC thing, apparently. And it, uh, the thread kind of goes for a little bit. They're, they're exchanging code, and then uh, somebody goes, uh, can we just put something in place here? And Linus gets triggered. Uh, now, this this is kind of juicy here, but Linus comes out and says, and to quote, honestly, I'm pretty damn fed up with buggy hardware and completely theoretical attacks that have never actually have shown themselves to be used in practice. So I think it's time we push back on the hardware people and tell them it's their problem. And if they can't even be bothered to say yay or nay, we just sit tight. Because... Let's put the onus where the blame lies and not just some random uh, stuff from bad hardware and say, oh, but it might be a problem. <laughs> Signed Linus. Yeah. So, yay, vulnerabilities. Yeah, As now, uh, I'm not necessarily like a hardware developer or like working with these lower level I. languages. So, but, uh, you know, Looking back on it, like the biggest like actual hardware hardware threat model that we actually had was uh I still have like Spectre and Har Spectre and Meltdown like stuck in my head. Mm -hmm. Yep. Which those are probably like the biggest popular ones. And yep. uh since then every single one of these hardware vulnerabilities that cause issues with software or like privilege escalation, a lot of them require physical access well spectre and meltdown it as well for the most part i don't know they were talking about a lot of these more hardware vulnerabilities uh that were discovered that are actually dangerous and as first were all speculative execution so all of them were basically in the same class as spectre and meltdown 
but there are on special on older hardware some other vulnerabilities that aren't speculative execution, which is probably what one of these was because it is PowerPC after all. Well, there are still modern PowerPC CPUs being made, so it could just be a newer system. Really? Yeah, I believe so. It's mostly like enterprise space that this is done. Uh, so I guess IBM. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. It's IBM. Okay. I mean, IBM be IBM. They they just uh, it, if it still makes money, they'll sell it. For sure. <laughs> But uh, I I know that like when we were discussing on the show earlier, uh, uh, I was talking about this article, and uh, you guys had some uh com- comments about about uh, these these theoretical attacks as well, and I'm just I'm just uh, curious on like uh what you what you guys uh s- said at the time. So, I used to work in security, as probably most of you already know. And because of that, I have a bit of a look at this. It was software security, of course, not hardware. But a lot of companies tend to want to just fix vulnerabilities for the sake of not having a number there, that there is a vulnerability there, there is, there is a CVE there. And all the time that becomes a practical, but before even whether it's practical or not, you would need you should look at how ma- how that vulnerability actually affects you because in reality about three quarters of vulnerabilities don't affect you they don't I and mean, most of them actually require user interactivity which yeah so especially for web services and stuff like that that becomes a lot less dangerous and some of them require, let's say, a lot of work on the on the attacker and on the user side to actually get it to be the exact right conditions. But yes, fixing some vulnerabilities is a good idea, but not but not all because not all actually you care about, you should care about. Right, and and just to kind of piggyback off of uh, Big Pod there. You know, I, I, I've kind of worked in this space as well, uh, specifically like with IT teams, right? And what I've kind of realized in, you know, years of working with people <laughs> is a lot of these teams, you know, wh- there's two things that I call, you know, practical risk and then perceived risk, right? And a lot of software nowadays that kind of runs in the background and, and, you know, pulls up risks, it doesn't really go between those, right? It doesn't care if it's practical or perceived risk or, you know, can it actually happen on the hardware or not? They just show it to the IT team and they are like, oh, this is a, even though it might be minor, um, this is a flaw, right? So like yeah. the ones that you mentioned, Spectra and the, and Meltdown, but um, uh, they they just get an overreaction, you know, to, to even theoretical risks that are more in that... Uh, perceived risk kind of assessment and it leaves you know these IT teams focusing on minor vulnerabilities and uh, quite honestly requesting way too much out of uh, you know vendors and stuff like that to to secure these vulnerabilities when it it can be very hard to exploit them I mean am I going to grab a laptop go directly to you know some piece of hardware access the hardware or am I going to bring a monitor up and actually access the hardware or you know, however, whatever attack vector you're planning on using, um, I just feel like they really need to start balancing risk versus, yeah. uh, you know, the perceived risk versus the practical risk. And I don't think a lot of companies do that. And, um, you know, they just, they start looking at statistics and numbers and where, where they're not needed. And it brings a lot of attention to these types of points. But I think if you start kind of highlighting the fact that some of these are just even theoretical in nature because you can't access them they really don't have any real world impact so i don't know i think i think we could do better as it teams and it security to to you know spend a little time look at the big picture figure out whether or not it's actually practical to patch these things one of the hardware vulnerabilities we talked about on the show was the yubikey vulnerability which was Mm -hmm. sort of hardware sort of software Mm -hmm. five six seven episodes ago 
and it it literally has that problem how will attacker actually get your device and all that and how is it useful to them which at the end when I actually look at the vulnerability it is actually you would need to get the hold of the key and then basically open it up and then you get enough access to copy the key but that's it you cannot exploit it because if you if you're using let's say it's using a second factor you still need to know the still need to know the password if and so on and it's mainly mainly that a bad guy can make a copy of it and even then it is still noticeable because somebody opened it up so right what's an action so you have to ask yourself what's your threat vector right. and a lot of these uh secops teams don't really do that anymore well you know you you uh go through college you get your degree in cybersecurity, and uh, your job is a cybersecurity consultant as in uh, they just pay you for you to tell them what's wrong and uh so it is basically I kind of comes around for some of these people because you know I've encountered them or uh th it's their job to tell you when there's a vulnerability and yeah. that's all they have to tell you they don't have to tell sure. you how severe it practically is yeah well another day we can all think of the time especially those of us who host websites when we get emails that there is a theoretical bug on our website that has a security problem and in reality it's and they want uh for us to pay them for them to find this bug or this for them to pay for us to pay them the bounty while in the reality the bug is basically not even a problem it's it's very theoretical and not really something you sh you care about Maybe they can put an an alert on their screen when they edit something in the HTML code or stuff <laughs> like that. Those are, those can be fun for them for them to tell you. Yeah, the most common one I get is, um, well, why can't you just update my Linux system? You know what I mean? Like, uh, you know, there's there's these minor, what we'll call them outstanding i don't know security issues right and they're like well we looked and you know it's ubuntu 22.04 server for example and 24.04 says it doesn't have it why don't you just upgrade it's like you're running a production system that has you know very important dependencies on whatever that operating system currently has and to make that leap to 24.04 on the server edition side you don't know what if that's going to bring your whole production down, you know what I mean? The whole production environment. And it's really wild to me that, you know, security teams and IT teams specifically will totally look away from that and just be, I mean, sometimes I'm handcuffed and I, I have to make the updates, right? And it's like, you know, we'll have to deal with whatever uh, happens in production, uh, in the production environment, and <coughs> patch it and fix it later, right? Like, for example, missing dependencies. Um, but they don't focus on like the really the easy stuff, right? Like, you know, th there's so many phishing attack, phishing attacks that like actually make it through, right? It's just, yeah. just the kind of like the social engineering portion of it, right? Yeah. Like they don't bother as much like focusing on the people who are their true vulnerability. I mean, like without the people, <laughs> there wouldn't really be much like stolen, you know, information or credentials or, you know, as many unpatched vulnerabilities just because of purely, you know, social engineering, malware um you know just emails that you open up and all of a sudden you have ransomware your whole company you know it's like it's funny that they don't focus on those as much at least in my my field i can't say that's everywhere but i just realize it's like you know you get these i think you get these consultants like you said earlier that uh really push these i don't know just Es escalation of, of actual vulnerabilities that aren't that big of a deal and they have to be patched. Yeah, I got a phone call one time for a guy that randomly drove by my, my workplace yeah. that called and said that my uh, that my Wi-Fi network was vulnerable because it broadcasts an SSID. 
Wow. <laughs> and he wanted a bounty of $20. <laughs> wow. Wow. That's a good one. And I'm like, Man. well, it's a good thing that we're in the middle of nowhere and I know exactly who you work for. <laughs> oh, I love it. I hope that guy's making some money out there. <laughs> uh, he must be. He must be. He's doing it. <laughs> but no, like uh, when it comes down to like... J- you know, it's stupid. It's and it's always like the stupidest thing that that uh, get, that uh, winds up being like the root cause of a security issue too. Mm-hmm. Uh, more often than not, like uh, I very recently got to, got working with my with uh, my village council on like figuring out what's wrong with their website. And one of the things that I noticed is that the web server, first of all, runs Debian six, <laughs> uh, and then broadcast root SSH access on port. 1997 because you know that's when the server was first installed and accepts a password over ssh wow yeah that's a perfect (laughs) point you you just nail it on the head those (laughs) are the ways that people are trying to exploit you it's not it's not (laughs) sitting down on your computer and and exploiting some you know memory leak in in some whatever proprietary hardware no, and even then, it's like I've been able to just call banks before mm-hmm. and get bank account numbers for people too. Wow! It's like, hey, I'm trying to get this number right. Can I? Can uh, you help me with this? Figure figure this out. It's like, uh, I'm trying to send money to this to this bank account, <coughs> and the teller would just give up and tell me. Wow! Which wow. I they're not you, supposed to. You need to make a video on that. Shoot, <laughs> I, I probably should, but then I'd be doxing myself pretty uh, super hard. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> there might be a lot of bleeping going on. <laughs> yeah, there there might be a lot of bleeping, a lot of blur, bl- blurred text. Right, uh, right. So uh, we're not going to be delving into that because, you know, when it comes, I'm just trying to, you know, help my little small growing community here that is, you know, a vacation hub to protect itself a little bit better. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> That's really all I'm trying to do. <laughs> but, uh, of course... Uh, let's, let's step away from security here because you got to remember, we are not a, we are not your IT security podcast. There are better shows for that. Uh, well, we, we moon, moonlight is one, but that's about it. Yeah. We, we joke <laughs> about it and, uh, it's, it's easy topics to talk about sometimes. <laughs> uh, and, uh, let's get talking about, uh, my personal favorite password manager. And I know that big pod, you love this one, this one a lot too. Yes. And Savvy Nick, I don't know. Uh, do you use Bitwarden at all? Nope. I stay away from those. Oh, okay. Okay. Why I see. You you're a classic guy. You're 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 actually remembering your passwords. And oh, typing absolutely. Them down. There, I yeah, only absolutely. Them. Can I give you a bit of a security advice? If you can remember your password and you're, you do not have uh, eidetic memory, your uh, password is easy to, to crack. Well, that's perfect. I got picture memory, so we're... We're good there. <laughs> oh, so okay. you're not doing the sticky note thing? <laughs> no, no sticky notes. <laughs> okay, okay. Well, anyways. No, I'm kidding, of course, but <laughs> no, uh, I, I, you have to reuse the same passwords occasionally, which kind of sucks, but uh, yeah, you make a couple really hard ones. <laughs> you know, this is the same password that I use at work, and then they have like this 90-day reset thing, so I just change oh. the number at the end of the password to the next number up. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, sure. stuff like that. And then, well, then any... you take that number and multiply it by three, and you get you get how how many months this person worked at the job. Yep. <laughs> those, are, yep. those are some tricks to figure out how people how old Love people it. are and shit like that. But anyways, uh, Bitwarden uh, has caused a little bit of controversy, as you know, uh, in their Git repository for the Bitwarden client. This is the desktop client. Uh, I don't know if it's like the browser extension, but this is the desktop client that uh, this is looking at right now. Okay. Well, uh, they introduced a build dependency on the Bitwarden slash SDK dash internal, which has the following clause in its license. You may not use this SDK to develop applications for use with software other than Bitwarden. Parenthesis including non-compatible implementations of Bitwarden, end parentheses, or to develop another SDK. Which, if you don't know what I'm talking about, 
Uh, this dependency is proprietary in its nature. It's a uh, it's not allowing a re reuse at all. Not allowing a redistribution supposedly. Yeah. So it's not respecting like the those four digital freedoms that you know the GNU that the GNU project likes to talk about, and this caused some issues with for Onyx readers of you know the greatest community on earth, <laughs> and well. Uh, it eventually turned into a GitHub issue, and the Bitwarden founder and CTO of of Kyle Spearin had to make a comment, of course. Uh, thanks for sharing your concerns here. We have been progressing making use of our SDK in most cases for our clients. However, our goal is to make sure that the SDK is used in a way that maintains GPL compatibility. One, there are two separate programs, the client and SDK completely different from each other. Uh, the code for uh, for each of them are in separate repositories. And uh, point three, uh, the fact that two programs communicate using a standards protocol does not necessarily mean that they are one program for the purpose of GPL v3. Yeah. Technically true. Actually completely true. Yeah. Uh, being able to build the app as you're trying to do here is an issue we plan to resolve and is merely a bug. Hmm. Happens. Of which... I'm not going to say yes or no on that until we see further detail. Because, well, yeah. Like, developer could have could have uh, been working on an internal version and accidentally pushed to a wrong repo. For all That's that That's entirely matters. possible. You know, like, uh, you, you get clone your Bitwarden repository, you get working on it, and uh, you forget to switch to the internal branch. Or, you know, uh, you just... You just CD into the wrong directory, and uh, oh. you you run your git commit and then your git push and potentially shows up in the wrong place. could have been just git pushing with the link to the actual like to the upstream instead of like to the specific uh, rem to just to a remote origin, which would automatically mean it really doesn't do if it, if it will just push to whatever it put you say it should push and that's it. So that could also be the problem. And there are many other versions of what could have happened that could cause something that is supposed to be internal to not be internal. Yeah, that said, they did come out like a few hours later on Twitter. Uh, I'm, I'm not calling it X. It's Twitter for life. <laughs> Sorry, Elon. Uh, but... Uh, they're calling this a packaging bug that was misunderstood as something more, and the team plans to resolve it. They remain contributed to the open source licensing model for years and c and plan to fully retain a fully free version for individual use. Hmm. So, Bitwarden says that they're still going to be open source, but uh, the Git repository su suggested differently beforehand. Uh, I am certain that uh, Big Pod and your very many various uh, software projects, you might have accidentally changed the changed the dependency and uh, yep. raised some questions in the past. Yeah, definitely have. Yeah, Nick, I know that you posted like a four hour tutorial on C plus plus, so <laughs> you've del you've delved into into uh, this at least this field before to some extent. I'm sure you've done much the same. Yeah, yeah, and and. I guess I'm interested to learn, um, you know, I, I think I have a different idea on, on server versus client. I mean, if, if, if it was on the server side of things, I could more understand the fact that you, you have a, basically a proprietary license versus a, you know, kind of an open source license. Right. Um, and that they could kind of still be on the guise of, okay, well, all this internal stuff that we need to keep everyone's information's you know, information, especially for a password manager secret. So it's unhackable, right? That they would keep that all under a closed source kind of a model. Um, so I'm not quite understanding the whole client thing and what the argument there was. I, I just can't imagine that for any reason really being closed source. I mean, well, for one, well, they it's could not closed have source. Like it's special, just proprietary special client. Like they, oh, for, for I all, for all the matter, they could be building a new I client. See. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they are, they're writing a new SDK for that mm -hmm. for that client, and maybe they were testing and accidentally pushed the internal version, which is basically could be the new version of the SDK sure. or an API. 
Gotcha. You should remember that a lot of companies that make software and hardware and have a server component will mm -hmm. it will then have for the for new for a specific client or a specific hardware piece a specific API endpoint set and stuff like mm -hmm. that. That's nothing new. So maybe they were building a new new client and they they basically went we were gonna use in a new SDK and for now it is internal because we do not want to share share what could be very much a crazy code. Sure. Yeah, and, yeah, I, and the... I, but I don't see the issues with any of that. Yeah. That's I don't that's see... where I don't Yeah, see I, the... I really don't. Issues with that either. I will see issues with that when it, when it's a pattern and happens for a long time. Mhm. Mm sure. Not going to agree with that. Well, do you think that this could just be raised by like those freedom fighters in the Pronix comments going like this sh this should be open source, I don't care how raw it is? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Short answer. I, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I I write a lot of software for myself, and most of it doesn't doesn't become open source unless I'm really sure. I should. I I'm gonna not let it go, but it is ready for use. If somebody yeah. is so so insane enough to use my software. Yeah. And and uh, Big Pod brings up a great point. That's exactly how I approach it too. It's like a lot of the stuff that I work on is never going to see the light of day unless I sit down and I actually, you know, do a video on it and really explain the intricacies of my code and what exists and how to use it and how to be able to use it. I don't think it makes much sense to just throw it out there cuz then it's just another piece of garbage hanging out that no one understands. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, I I'm with you on that for sure. And and that's how I approach my 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 coding as well well i'm not a coder uh we're just going to say this ahead of time uh, i think i've mentioned this before that the the most i've delved into coding was scripting in bash and like uh, before then i might have stolen code to write world of warcraft add-ons <laughs> <laughs> well, that's about as far as i've ever gone yeah well, i did write lua then just a little bit a little bit yeah, and you you can find links to that stuff in, in like my various <laughs> Git repositories that I don't merge into like one master uh, Git Forge place. So it's scattered between GitLab, GitHub, SourceHut, CodeForge, <laughs> all those other all. places. Because you know, I just there was just one point when in life where it's just like I was just hopping around Git Git services. Sure. Uh, I even maintained like SVN repositories on Google Code for a while. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> but yeah that that's like the most i've ever dealt with and yes i have accidentally you know pushed an update to an add-on that you know maybe i shouldn't have and you know um nobody used my stuff so i never got a bug report <laughs> sure. so i wouldn't know <laughs> but anyways uh I think we can wrap it up there for like uh, the topic of the article. So uh, we still got a little bit of time here. So uh, Nick, uh, we have invited you on this podcast because you know uh, you kept you kept showing up on my YouTube recommendations. So the <laughs> algorithm works for you, All right. uh, probably because you know how you you have this thing that we ha that uh, we're working on. And that's called an audience, right? Yeah. And uh, specifically, like your Bcash FS video start popped up for me first. Because, you know, that's something I was looking into at the time because that's when we first t talked about it on the show. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've delved a little bit down the rabbit hole ever since. But uh, for the viewers that might not know who you are, uh, could you explain what what it is your channel is about? Yeah. So my channel is mainly about Linux, of course. Uh, I really started with Linux tutorials. Um, specifically, I was dealing with the server space quite a bit at the job. So um, I thought... You know, I started this about five years ago, so I've been at it for a little bit now um, and thought, hey, people could learn a little bit more about the Linux space and specifically the server space in Linux and uh, how to get their own servers going. And, um, you know, one thing led to another. I s kept going more and more down the Linux rabbit hole. <coughs> and uh, that's where I'm at today. After five years, just now I'm in all sorts of stuff. You know, I get involved in a little bit of the news a little bit of development, a little bit of engineering, uh, preach it to the people that don't use it. And, uh, you know, that's kind of the channel in a nutshell. Uh, I still enjoy using it every single day. Um, I use it on every single one of my projects, all of my cloud servers, everything like that. Um, it's just so easy for development. 
that's why I've stuck with it for, you know, this many years. Well, it turns out when you crash your system, you get an error code. <laughs> fair, fair. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you can actually figure out what happened. <laughs> Potentially. That's a great point. Sometimes, sometimes you just stuck Googling. <laughs> yeah, I mean, a lot of times, but at least you can. Yeah, so uh, I did a search on your channel just now, mm-hmm. and uh, I've noticed that there is a lack of Gen 2 videos. So, uh, sir. Zero. Yeah, uh, <laughs> there are no there are no Gen 2 videos on your channel. <laughs> Uh, is that is that a hint? I need to start making some. Uh, you, you probably should. Uh, <laughs> I, I might start showing up in your comments uh, mentioning such. <laughs> <laughs> Great! Now I'm getting raided. Fantastic! I've been trying to avoid this for five years, and you're going to be the one who uh, breaks the camel's back, as they say. No, well, uh, you see, uh, to be fair, you're not the only uh, random YouTuber that draws my ire. Like, there's a lady that posts cat videos. I do, I do it for on her channel as well, just for fun of it. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I guess we'll see in the comments section. That's awesome. Um, but yeah, that's, okay. that that is one thing I've avoided this entire time, just because I I don't want the pain. I'm not gonna lie, I don't want to build everything from source. I don't want to bother. I don't. I just don't want to get involved. Like you'll notice early on in my videos, I used to do a lot of Arch Linux. And specifically, like, uh, there's one which uh, I still to this day love. Their dot files. Uh, their name is Oxvara. So A X V A R V A. I think um, they have an absolutely gorgeous X Monad setup, and I have been writing that for like three years, and that's where I stop things. I spent oh my gosh, probably like six hours setting everything up getting a computer and a capture card together so I could, you know, film all that and, and just get it in the perfect light so people can install it because I thought it was so great. And ever since that painful video, I just, I have (laughs) pretty much avoided anything to do with, uh, you know, anything outside of, uh, well, GUI installers. (laughs) (laughs) Arch Linux actually is not that hard to set up once you, once you not. actually like figure out what the commands you're running it's actually not. do. But now explaining it to somebody, can you say the same thing? No. Yeah. <laughs> I, instead, what, instead, what I do for like when I'm explaining like how to install Arch Linux, I typically point them a lot to the Gentoo wiki because the Gentoo wiki, <laughs> like the Arch ins- install instructions, actually explains to you what you're doing. <laughs> yeah. Well, ever since they released that um, the script, the Arch uh, installer script, uh, it's it's really easy. Well, yeah, you boot up the session and you type in Arch install and hit enter. And then you just have, it's, it, it it originally started as like just nothing but prompts. Right. But now you actually have a menu. Oh, really? (laughs) Yeah. I didn't even know that. Okay. Uh, I've been been watching, I've been watching the Arch install project for a while. Like, uh, even before, like it was, uh, like, uh, since before it was even on the ISO, I've, I've been watching it because it's just a Python script. If, if Mm -hmm. you want to test it out. Get clone repository dot slash run arch, arch install dot pi. Yep. Or Python. The, uh, have yeah. you, uh, there's another one that was a little, it was a goofy one. I think I installed DWM on <laughs> Ubuntu minimal or maybe yeah. Ubuntu server or something like that. <laughs> that was just goofy. It was just like a random side project. I was like, oh, I wonder if I could get it all, you know, set up and what, what would it look like? Uh, as far as you know, RAM usage and, and and all the storage space that it would take, and it it was pretty impressive actually. Even with Ubuntu, it was it was low down there. I can't remember exactly what it was, but well, I mean, DWM is quite literally just Xorg because uh, all DWM does is it calls on the Xorg libraries to yep. hey hey X, I need you to draw a root window for a graphical environment. Okay, yep. uh, that's your wallpaper. Uh, hey uh, X, uh, we're we're uh, my user is requesting that I want to open up this application window. Can you do that for me? That's all yep. DWM does. Yeah. <laughs> Realistically. Yeah. It it doesn't actually do anything too fancy by itself. Uh, that's where the patches come in. They do that. Right. And it's like, I can't remember. It's like 30 megabytes or something like that of RAM. It's, it's something like really small, 50 megabytes. I don't know what it was, but it's, it's pretty wild. Yeah. Now, uh, Big Pod is probably going to step in here, and he's going to want to uh, push his uh, wonderful immutable distributions. Uh, of course, you mess around with the, with these uh, at all, like the Fedora Silverblue, uh, the uh, Knoids, uh, the OpenSUSE. Uh, what are they calling it now? 
Uh, Kalpa and uh, uh, I still call it micro OS, but it's not micro yeah. OS anymore for the desktops. <laughs> Aeon. Yeah. Doesn't doesn't Ubuntu have the core or whatever it is? Yeah. That- yes, but it's, but it's not officially released yet. It's yes. not okay. I don't really mess with Immutable. I think I did one video on Immutable, a, trying to do my best to kind of explain it, um, and probably <clears throat> failed. I don't know how that how well that video did, but uh, where I actually had a lot of interest was uh, real time, and. Uh, I probably started working on that just, I don't mean to switch the subject, but it, it, it is something interesting that's part of the... It's fine. Yeah. It excited me because I worked on it for about six months. I, I, I work with like industrial control systems and uh, uh, real time really makes a difference in, yeah. in you know predictability for those types of systems. And uh, I spent about six months trying to make, uh, well, first patch the kernel uh, to, to have the real time kernel patch on it. But, uh, and I, I got that done. That didn't take me six months. What took me six months is to prove whether or not it was hard real time. <laughs> and <laughs> yep. at the end of, at the end of the six, you know, excruciating months, I, I proved that it was not, it was soft real time, which means, ah, we can, if you, you want to preempt a, um, you, uh, like a task, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll do it. But if it's running and um, it's, a, let's say, about to finish, I'm just going to let it, you know, kind of finish. So it's not time critical, basically. Yeah. On a true real time, you know, hard real time, as they call it, yeah. uh, system, you would completely like you'd crash the system because it's yeah. time critical. Yeah. And, there is uh, a reason the- VX works and stuff like that are still used instead of Linux. Mm hmm. Exactly. Yep, and and I learned the hard way. Um, no matter how hard I tried, I never got it to hard real time, and it's something I haven't gone back to because of all the pain. <laughs> but um, I'd be interested now that uh, after what thirty three years, they finally, you know, have it's a actually stable, in the kernel. It's actually in the kernel. It's not a yeah, patch. Yeah, which uh, I think the the only reason why it took so long was because uh, Linus Linus just. I think I remember reading at one point he had no idea what the heck the patches were actually doing and he wanted somebody to explain them. <laughs> <laughs> I don't doubt it. I don't doubt it. Because it, it, it's not a small patch set, first oh, of all. Oh, no. Yeah, yeah. because... Uh, so I have experience as a user of mm. uh, heavy machinery and uh, specifically from like my experience working in plastic injection molding. Oh, sweet. And, yeah. uh, you know, these, these are software-controlled machines. They are precision mach- machines. And, mm-hmm. you know, I have timings that I have to adjust to make, make sure that certain things happen at certain times. Yep. So mold opens, mold closes, plastic injects. Uh, we want plastic to inject that specifically this pressure point for this long and then stop yep. at this distance. Yep, yep. Uh, that's yep. all very time critical. Exactly. Yeah. So uh, that's where a real-time system is very beneficial. Uh, now, lighted... I was, these were production machines, so I wasn't doing the stupid things that I normally do on my own, d- on my own <laughs> at home, all right? But the temptation was there. <laughs> because it turns out that uh, those machines ran on Debian. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, like, I wonder what happens if I just switch the kernel to like oh. this non-Linux Im- Linux image dash AMD 64 dash RT. <laughs> so just to say... Because like you both of you have experience, and only thing I know is that VX works exists because I know that JPL uses it for the rollers. Ah. That's that's where yeah. my understanding of real time operating system ends. <laughs> or I I know a bit more that that if you fill the RAM, it doesn't actually crash. That's what yeah. I know, <laughs> <laughs> and that's where it ends. I know yeah, I know it's used on rockets and. That's it. Sure. Sure. And, I love rockets. And, yeah. <laughs> well, Nick gave a pretty good explanation as to what how a real-time system actually works. Yeah. It's basically just on a normal system, uh, you, you make a request for the CPU to do something. The CPU will finish what, what it's currently doing and then do, do the thing that you requested. On a real-time system, you tell it that this thing is a priority and he's done now. CPU stops whatever it's doing right now and does that thing now. Yeah. 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 That that's basically the big difference. Yep. And CPUs are really fast at what they do nowadays. 
but they're not perfectly fast. Right? Yeah. That's, or that's why we have to that's why we have to have these hard stops go like stop what you're doing and need mm-hmm. you to do this thing right now. That's why that's why we have these real time systems. Because you know, it turns out that uh what you know, current computation systems uh are not like instant. Yep. <laughs> and, and and go ahead. The the reason rockets and rovers need to use real time operating systems, it's let's remember that the Perseverance rover, which was which was launched a couple of years ago to Mars, still uses the CPU from fifteen years ago. <laughs> yeah. Or is it and, 20? Uh, it is a, it was a while ago. The and red lever power PC. It's one of the most cool things ever. <laughs> yeah, and the the main reason why they did that was because, you know, they're launching this thing into space, first of yes. all. They're, so they don't know what environment this is actually going to experience. So they want to make sure to run on a system that's very well tested, first of all, on our world. And then they want to spend the money in engineering to make sure that it works on other worlds as well. well they do know it. They they do know what kind of environment they're gonna send it because Mars is a known environment by now. But they also know that the environment is highly ra- radioactive. But the radioactive means sun's radioactivity, not the the nuclear kind. And, yeah, and there is varies. a lot of a lot of things hitting that CPU, and that can cause problems. That's why. I said it's a, it's a red CPU, which it doesn't mean it's cool, but it means it's it's hardened <laughs> against against radiation. Yeah, yeah. It, it's not that uh, you know Intel doesn't want to give NASA the latest and greatest CPU. It's just that the it NASA chose that CPU used. for a reason. Yeah. But even then, if if Intel had to pick, or you know, if a hard if NASA had to pick like a brand new hardware system to uh, put onto, they might not go Intel because you know there's been some microcode issues with Intel lately. No, I, I am gonna say they wouldn't probably wouldn't go and choose the latest, as as big of a big of a lithography architecture as possible, better because there is smaller the components are more likely it is it's gonna mess uh, the, that radiation is gonna mess things up. Yep. I remember that there's actually like a Linus Tech Tips tour of JPL. At least mm-hmm. I think it's JPL. He went. In, they went into a NASA facility and yeah. they were looking at some of the old, these old computer systems from like the Apollo, the, from yeah. like the Apollo missions. And uh, these computers were massive, even for that day's age, where computers yeah. were already the size of small rooms. <laughs> well, no, actually, those were small for those times. Because like they the had transistors. to fit, yeah, transistors. Because <laughs> they had to fit on a rocket, on yeah. on Saturn V, and they had to fit on well, what were essentially relatively small elements. But the reality is, today I can take my my Samsung and I have more compute power in that thing <laughs> that the entire Saturn V with all its components had in itself. Which, pretty cool. So, uh, we have talked about uh, Windows Recall a few times uh, oh. on, the, on the show by now. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I just randomly opened up Nick's YouTube page. And uh, th- the thing that steps out is a video about Recall. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. Uh, I haven't watched the video. But, you know, <laughs> I, I have looked at the thumbnail and I have read the title. Yeah. Apparently, it's time to switch to Linux. <laughs> <laughs> Did you know uh, that Recall's opt-in? Um, yes. So to, okay. it, to, in it, to an extent, um, I don't want to say that Microsoft and I'm reiterating a bit of the video, but, uh, the, the point of the video was to kind of shed light on the fact of how they've approached this whole, uh, process of actually releasing recall to the masses and how screwed up that has been. And of course, it's not a first for Microsoft by any stretch of the imagination. But I, I just, I was hoping with that video to open up a little bit of, you know, some people's eyes who might necess- not have necessarily heard of Linux or anything like that, or even another operating system like Mac OS is fine too. But to realize that how uh, intrusive they're being, I mean, to be 
quite frank, you know, they started and I'm going back a little bit, but a few months ago, you know, whenever they first released it, we, uh, heard about this feature. Okay. It's going to take screenshots of the computer. It's going to be able to recall certain contexts from whatever you were doing in previous days, stuff like that. All, all good, whatever. Um, didn't take long for someone to hack it. It was, they were storing, you know, information in the SQL light database. Uh, I don't think it was encrypted at all, um, which was pretty wild. Um, so it was like just a matter of a couple of days before, you know, someone was able to successfully hack this thing. And they're like, Oh, look how unsafe this is, of course. So it just felt super rushed, even in the preview, you know what I mean? And big pot, did you have something to say? Yeah. I like, as uh... I'm not going to say that the preview probably had all the security features that would be available on launch because sure. my guess is they tried to get it as soon as possible because well, it, it was supposed to be a divisive topic anyway. So maybe they thought if somebody, if, if people got it in their hands, mm -hmm. they might be less inclined to go. Ah, right. Exactly. So, here but they made part... a mistake of of making people go ah a lot more. A little bit too much, right? So yeah, <laughs> that's that's the spoon feeding. Oh, it's gonna be okay, you know what I mean? This isn't forceful. But then, you know, we keep playing this out, right? So um gets gets sent out super early. It's clearly not ready for the masses, uh, not even in preview, in my opinion. Um gets hacked, okay, whatever, let's get past that. And then they keep going back and forth. Are we going to allow this to be, you know, uninstalled? Is it going to break dependencies like the file explorer? Is it um, going to be a feature? Can we disable it from the command line? You know, these are all things they're just experimenting with us in the fly, like as they're just sending random updates out. And then they're like, oh, no, this isn't going to be part of uh, Windows. It's only for the Copilot PCs, you know, Copilot Plus PCs that we're going to be selling. Next thing you know, Chris Titus is picking it up and it's in the background enabled, even though it's a hook. I'm not saying that it's actually enabled in the background or anything like that. But why build the hook in? You know what I mean? Like, clearly, they're just trying to work out what they're even going to do with this feature. Uh, uh, and it's annoying. Um, they're just playing. Go ahead. I... Uh, recently, I read how Windows is actually built on mm -hmm. the like on the API side, and that might be just the side effect of how they build their operating system. Because based on what how I understand is they have one common API that gets for all for one common one common set of features. They call one common API that go for all all systems. So for with that would be server, desktop, uh, their own version, internal version of Windows Server, so on. So it's possible that things got like it got into the wrong version of the uh, of the of the API in the long level because mm -hmm. it's supposed to be somewhat of a of a desktop feature, mm -hmm. and they might not have had proper skewing of. Uh, of uh, the Copilot Plus version of Windows <laughs> and a normal right. version of Windows. Yeah. And yes, a lot of people will not say you're defending Microsoft. <laughs> uh, no, it's... when it when it comes to when it comes to Windows, I like yeah. to play the devil's advocate when it comes to Linux users. So sure. that's sure, my sure. that's my uh, and, and I love it and actions. I love it because you're you're not wrong, but you start adding all of these things together and they complete incompetency in the way that they're approaching this rollout. It just feels like it's been such a disaster and they're trying to force something down our, our throats. And, and that, that's been my take on it. Um, there's, there's a couple other things, um, uh, you know, that, that we don't even need to get into that they keep just like poking us with, but I'm hoping, I'm hoping here's, here's what I'm hoping for. They do release it great for the people who want to use it great you just have an option to uninstall it and i'm happy you know what i mean and when i say uninstall it that means remove the complete binary from the system no traces left of it no dependencies nothing that has to deal with it i don't want it integrated like they've done in the past with like cortana with the rest of like the shell and all that crap and then you go delete cortana i don't know if you remember that one at the beginning of it but that one was a mess too you you'd, you'd break the you'd break the shell 
It was like, it was wild. So I just don't want that type of rollout again. And I would much rather people start looking at different options than ending up with these types of solutions being forced down our, you know, throats. Well, at the end of the day, whatever operating system you're using, there will be features that the, the developer of the operating system will, will force on you. I don't like yeah. the use of that word because I would say you're using that operating system. You, you chose it. So now you are in some ways you're dependent or you're, you're mm -hmm. okay with whatever changes they make. And, and I'm okay with that, but there's a little nuance I like to look at is they don't do it all at once. You know what I mean? Just like, I don't know this kind of stuff. It does happen on Linux. Might I point you at, yeah. at Ubuntu? <laughs> Okay. <laughs> also, Are you talking? But, also, but well, I guess my point was uh, back on the Windows side of things was uh, they, they, they plan this out over, you know, years. It's not all at once. They never approach anything like, oh, let's just. Uh, Are you all sure it wasn't planned within the last two years and they were just very, very, yeah. very quick to implement oh, it? Oh, yeah. no, no, no. It absolutely was. This portion was. But. <laughs> But like the the subtle change, the the problem is uh, someone ends up being locked into an ecosystem, but they keep changing the ecosystem and locking them in further. That's my problem with it. Yeah. Um. And then people don't even realize they have choices of of escaping that ecosystem because they've slowly been um, trapped into it. For example, I'll give you another one. The the cloud, right? You have to log in to their cloud service in order to actually have an account on Windows when you're installing it nowadays. Was that yes. the case? Two, three years ago? Yes, it yeah. was. But it was a lot easier to make a local user account. Go try making a local user account on an install nowadays. Mm. Well, I think nowadays you have to be able to drop into a command prompt. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Depends on That's, those are the things I have issues is. with. Depends on from when your eyes say is. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. But those are the types of things what that they're doing in the background that is... Uh, that I'm not a fan of. And I feel like that's exactly what's going to happen with Recall. Yeah, well, uh, for for now, it is being pushed. In, it is in Windows Update, it, so it's already here. Mm -hmm. uh, to my understanding, it is supposed to be opt-in, and it is removable. Yep. Uh, I have seen multiple sources, uh, not just you know a YouTube commenter on, on our last episode, uh, come out and say that, Yes, you can remove uh, recall, and it won't break uh, File Explorer. Sure. Yeah. So maybe, maybe, <clears throat> but you know, we're talking about like you. You're saying that you you said that you pushed that video out, saying that hey, uh, maybe this will get people off of Windows. Well, putting ads in the Task Manager mm -hmm. <laughs> didn't get people off of Windows, so I don't see recall getting people off of Windows. <laughs> Yeah, no, there's going to really. be a there's going to be a small portion. It's a very, very, very small portion. The people who are there and they're stuck in it, they're stuck in it. You know what I mean? Uh, but yeah. there are there are people on the fence. You know whether that's thousands or whatever. It's not you know millions um, that that just need to see like what they're doing in the background because it's hard to follow all this. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like no one's no one's doing the research that you know we do and then uh, d give it to the masses, right? Like. Not a, an individual person is not going to put that much time into, uh, you know, realizing the trends of what they're doing, right? And if that's enough to push them over the edge to another operating system, I think that's a fantastic thing. Yeah, that that could be true, but of course, uh, people people are probably sick and tired of us talking about recall. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you got me started on this one. <laughs> that, that's true. That's true. This is like it was the first thing I saw when I looked at the channel. I, I also see that uh, apparently you're using Zed now. Yeah, I've uh, switched over a little bit from, you know, what happened there was uh, uh, I use GCP with uh, Ubuntu server on a lot of my uh, deployment applications. How um, can you do that? Come I, on. Oh. I abs absolutely love it. Now, I got locked in a while back, but <laughs> um, okay. part of it was Visual Studio Code. Uh, I use it for um, remote programming, you know, you can set yeah. up for like through SSH. It is. A, yeah. It's garbage garbage because of how many uh extensions that they uh install in the background and i'm i run pretty lean servers you know it doesn't have a lot of memory like four gigs for example um and 
it just it crashes all the time because it is such a memory hog for all their little extensions that I had to find something else. And Zed wow. is turning out to be help. What's up? Well, yeah, like I remember I was trying to set up an image for me to work based on like an OCI image for me to have the whole GCP stack in there, like all the all their applications. Oh. And <laughs> I, I kind of went insane because of how many they are and yeah. how how my repository hated me, my registry. <laughs> Why? <laughs> like if you if you look at something like uh, uh. Amazon or uh, what's yeah. the other one? Microsoft. Yeah, uh, sure. How how small their CLI their CLIs are compared to GCP one? <laughs> You're not wrong. You're not wrong. Absolutely not. That, I won't argue that. That complete set is multiple gigabytes in size. <laughs> Well, I'll let you know that I'm still a very happy Emacs user. There you go. <laughs> uh, uh, even though, you know, I'm using this modern Linux system on this uh, fresh, <laughs> fresh, uh, hot and fresh Debian 12 installation, uh, I do have Emacs installed and it is, com and it is fully configured. Uh, we have been working on this Emacs configuration nonstop for the past nine years oh wow <laughs> <laughs> because you know uh it's always open in a buffer somewhere <laughs> sure <laughs> yeah but you know uh I, i'm not messing around with like uh th this stuff that uh you probably del delve into like i'm not really building anything in my in my editor i'm not enabling like uh completions for for that you would get out of an ide or anything yeah, like that exactly uh, so I don't really need a lot of this stuff here. So I'm curious, can you sell me on Zed? Can you get me off of Emacs? Um, you know, quite honestly, I wouldn't want to. <laughs> I think I think if you're in Vim or Emacs and you and you love using it, you should remain there. I don't think there's any code editor, visual code editor that you can use that can really compare. But um, if you're, it, let's just say you're using Visual Studio Code, and uh, I can get you to switch on to Zed. I'd say it's it's faster, it requires a lot less memory, and it, it's got almost every feature that you need at this point, minus the debugger. I hope they and there we go. Soon. <laughs> uh, <laughs> there we go. <laughs> but I, yeah, I mean, I deb I'm still one of those people who debug in the terminal, so I'm, I, I'm I, old like that. I see no reason to debug in terminal. <laughs> like I like pain. <laughs> uh, you know we what my have so many nice tools for debugging. We do. They're Why do we bloat? <laughs> stick ourselves in the, the stupid terminal? Because sometimes it's just hard to set up. That's my only gripe with it. Um, you know, it, it, they they really. I don't know when it when it comes to like hardware debugging, um, like C C plus plus code. Yeah. Um, it's really hard to get a good environment set up with, uh, with, uh, hardware. So, um, they use different compilers that aren't, they don't jive well with, with, uh, debuggers online or sorry, debuggers in, 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 uh, visual code editors and it just becomes a mess and it's slow. It crashes. It does all this fun stuff. So old reliable, just like he, just like Josh likes using Emacs old reliable in the terminal, you know, just using um, the GNU de debug tools. That's it. Well, uh, I, I'm glad that there's somebody that out there still still using the GNU tools <laughs> because you know uh, that th they put a lot of effort into those. Somebody better be using them. <laughs> <laughs> They're wonderful, even to this day. Yep. Now, uh, of course, uh, the 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 big nice thing that I see about Zed is that it's is that it's built off of uh, the old Git GitHub Atom editor? I believe mm -hmm. it is a fork, right? Yeah, I think it is. Uh, so uh, to to an extent, because I think Atom was like Java, wasn't it? Nope. It was Electron. At it Atom. was Electron. Yeah. Atom was the original Electron app. Ah. Like literally, original Electron app. And the ironic part is, uh, Microsoft then built a better Electron app than than the creators yeah, of Electron sad. ever did. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't realize that. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm curious if you... I'm curious, though, like, uh, mm -hmm. if you've tried getting, like, those old Atom extensions working in Zed. I haven't. Not yet. 
you you haven't yet. Well, I haven't I'm ran sure in any reason to do it yet. I mean, I'm sure that there's somebody out there that's curious. Yeah, I, I definitely, definitely. Because you know that's that's like a that's like a headline defining feature for Zed is that uh, it's built off of Adam. And if I'm a developer that fell in love with Adam and used exclusively Adam as my as my editor of choice, mm-hmm. uh, I'm certain that I would have a couple extensions I would like to you know still use. Yeah, and I and I kind of I'm looking at the I'll call them you know eighty percent of developers who aren't actually doing some kind of crazy you know project with very like peculiar hardware that requires a whole bunch of special tools and all this like you know if you're writing a python script and you you want to be able to write something up fairly quick make sure that there's not a bunch of telemetry that's being you know thrown out to microsoft yeah go use zed it's pretty easy you know what i mean if you want a similar environment as well yeah so um glad to see that that's running around now of course uh that's probably going to be about it for the show here for today well so, before that i have oh. a question uh what's your take on the bcash fs drama oh boy <laughs> um oh man <laughs> i i mean i i i i completely agree with Linus on that whole deal. Um, to be quite honest, um, the way that, uh, it's Kent, right? Kent was just Kent over street. Yeah. He just seems like he's using the Colonel as some, uh, place he can, some little place he can experiment on. And, and, uh, he's, he's pulling way too much in with, with individual merges. It doesn't seem like it's being tested, at least from what I can tell. Uh, Linus has brought up uh, valuable points and he has to protect the colonel and that's what he's been doing and that's all he's doing. He's not, I don't think he's out there trying to piss people off. I don't think he's trying to be mean to Kent or anything like that. He's just show, stating the obvious and I don't think Kent's listening, but hopefully hopefully that changes. I think they're going to resolve it, to be honest. I think Kent is just a little, little uh, what do you call it, adamant about the way he likes to do things. Yeah, and it's like uh, when, when you're when you're doing this kernel development, uh, I don't know how how long Kent's been using Git itself, but you know the way that people used to do Git repositories, and this is the way that the kernel does Git repositories, is you have your own version of your own Linux repository, mm-hmm. <laughs> and you do all your stuff there. <laughs> yeah. Yep. And then eventually, you know, you come up with a patch set, and then hopefully uh, it still works with the modern versions of the kernel. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I do think that uh, BCAT, it, it's a, it's an interesting story, and I'm curious to see, like, uh, what more comes out of that conversation, because I am certain that it is still not ongoing, and it's going to be going for a short while still. <laughs> <laughs> for sure. Because you know, I still see that the they they are exchanging emails uh, back and forth. You know, uh, some some be more productive than not. But anyways, uh, if you would like to, you know, uh, if you have insight on this Bcash FS drama, which I'm certain that there's somebody that listen that uh, pays attention to our show, whether they listen or watch it, uh, they would probably know a thing or two. You can send us an email. Uh, this is a tip email, and. Uh, that's all you have to say is that it's a tip email because we've gotten angry emails. We haven't gotten any happy emails yet. Sorry. Uh, but you know, I would appreciate a happy email if somebody wants to send us a happy email. Uh, because you know, all we've gotten are just angry emails. We, I think we've gotten like three of them, right? Big pod. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we, two. we even got two. one that said, said in the subject line, this is an angry email. What? <laughs> <laughs> so you can always send us an email to this email address that you're seeing on the screen right now, which is contact at tuckspace.com. That is, in fact, a real email address on a real server somewhere. Yes. Yes. <laughs> of, of course, if you would just like to hang out with uh, people that discovered that this show, uh, we have a Discord community. It is going to be linked in, in the show notes, uh, or if you're watching us on YouTube, it's in the description down below, because heaven forbid, I am not putting that link anywhere in my face. Uh, and if you really, really, really like the show, and you want to support us, because ultimately, at the end of the day, we're doing this the hard way. Uh, we, you can go to patreon.com slash no tucks allowed, where you can sign up for the only tier, which is $5. Uh, 
Actually, the, I'm wrong. There's two. There's the two tiers. Three tiers, actually. Three tiers. They, <laughs> yeah. Okay. I, I realized I was wrong as soon as I said that. <laughs> but you know, you sign up for the tier right now. You get you get a higher quality audio feed for the for the show itself because realistically, that's all we could think to put in that tier right now. And there's a chance I had exclusive content later in the future, as you know, uh, more people decided that hey, uh, this. Th- this we like this show we're giving them money and you know every now and then i might want to hop in there hop in your rss feed and give you a thank you message or you know tell you what i happened to do that day because you know sometimes i just like doing things like that or you know even just stop and say good morning but anyways uh that uh that's if for some reason i upset you because you know i wore a white t-shirt you can find my contact information at this link here below me. Uh, th- this address that you're seeing right here is a Fediverse account. Uh, that's the at tenleyj at fostodon.org. Uh, that is, you plug that into your Fediverse enabled social media application, whether it be your threads or your mastodons, or uh, I think they have one nowadays I discovered. It's called Knitter. It's, it uses uh, the, the uh, protocols and everything. So cool. Uh, there's also Pleroma. If, if you know what I'm talking about, you know exactly what this address does. You can also just send send uh, me a comment on the YouTube video because, you know, uh, we have uh, these wonderful things for uh, YouTube as well. And Big Pot also has his own. <laughs> yep. And, of course, uh, Nick, if anybody wants to get in contact with you, how do they do that? Pretty simple. Just go on YouTube, search Savvy Nick, check the channel out, and you'll find your way if you can if you're savvy enough. Yeah, that's savvy with two V's, not that's, one. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> For because you know we're extra savvy. We're extra savvy. But anyways, guys, that's it for the show. I'm probably going to be switching back to Gen Two. We'll see you later. <laughs> Goodbye. Bye.